The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Hi, I'm Peter Groom, class of 75, and it's my great privilege today to introduce our next speaker, Maria Sparopoulou, who is uh, going to talk to us about the uh, Large Hadron Collider and the discovery of the Higgs. I remember, I think it was July 4th of last year, I stayed up in the middle of the night to watch this, and there were two presenters, and uh, she was one of them. Uh, her resume is, I, I just glanced at it, I wouldn't even have time to read all the headings on it in the amount of time that I'm allotted. But at any rate, let's have a warm welcome for Dr. Spiropulu. Um, thank you. So, uh, yeah. I'm going to be fast with this. This is liquid nitrogen. I'm going to be careful also. This is not uh, for visual effects, okay? I got a piece of gadolinium, okay? To, it's a metal, but it doesn't stick on a magnet. You see, it falls, right? So uh, I'm going to immerse it in the liquid uh, nitrogen here. <laughs> and we're going to see what happens while I'm giving the lecture. <laughs> For the rest of the lecture, that is an effect. It's not only the wrong part, you get to have that, I guess. I'm going to be talking to you about the Higgs and um, where it's taking us, hence the Higgs quo vadis. Um, this is Mr. Higgs uh, in a recent picture. Um, and um, before I start, I want to make an impression on everyone that um, the the standard model, what we call the standard model, okay, we're going to get to that. The standard model of uh, particles and their interactions, known as the standard model of particle physics, um, is the, the most, the only actually predictive uh, theory or model that can explain phenomena uh, that span um, uh, an enormous amount of orders, an enormous uh, set of orders of magnitudes, down to the 10 to the minus 24, from the atomic scale to the subatomic nuclear to the particle scale. Um, we don't have in, in physics or in any other science any such model. Uh, so uh, the Higgs was the last, uh, was the last uh, grail. Um, which, uh, by the end of this lecture, I want to convince you that it is the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of a big adventure in terms of understanding uh, our physical world. Um, so this is the outline. I'm going to describe a little bit what happened last July. Um, and then I'm going, instead of giving you the story about the Higgs, with uh, molasses and fish in the water and fogs, I'm going to discuss the Higgs as it happened historically and how people got this idea uh, about um, the, the Higgs mechanism. And uh, that was condensed matter in vacuum, taking ideas of condensed matter and applying them in the vacuum. That was the demonstration we just saw. What you just saw was the reverse of spontaneous symmetry breaking, the reverse Higgs mechanism, and we will get to that. Um, I will um, ask the question if it is the Higgs and how we are going to address this question experimentally. And uh, I will talk a little bit about supersymmetry 
um, which I personally have been looking for the enti my entire life, 20 years, starting from the Devadran. Out vincere, out mori means or you conquer or you die. And at the moment, in the news, blogs, uh, etc., cetera, um, supersymmetry is presented as dead, but it isn't. So the, 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 the rumors of the death of supersymmetry is greatly exaggerated. Um, dark matter and the connection with dark matter, we, we do know that dark matter exists. So uh, Vincere, it conquers, it, it's, a bad, it's a big part of our universe. What it is, other than its gravitational interactions, we don't know. We have clues and ideas, and we describe it as if we know what it is. Also, in the context of particle physics, we say it's a new particle. We don't know that this is the case. It's a good idea, and we are well guided by the theories, but we don't know if this is, the, the, um, if this is what it's turned out to be. Um, for the Higgs, um, I will comment, I will finish by commenting what are the roads ahead, where are we going with the Higgs, which new vistas uh, it opens, and, and why. Um, let me go to the, a little bit to describe uh, the landscape here. This is the French-Swiss border, and um, the Large Hadron Collider is uh, 100 meters on this circle, 27 uh, kilometers circumference. Uh, we've got two mu multi-purpose detectors called CMS, the um, compact neon solenoid, and ATLAS. Um, this is a toroidal large apparatus uh, and, and compact neon solenoid. And then we've got uh, dedicated experiments for other studies. Um, Caltech um, has been working at the CMS since the beginning of the experiment. And uh, uh, actually, I wanted to, it's on the French side, CMS is on the French side, and Atlas on the Swiss side. CERN is here, the airport is here. The, the Large Hadron Collider is built 100 meters down with a little bit of tilt. One of the reasons of the tilt is so that we don't shoot particles to the passengers in the airport. Um, <laughs> At CMS on the French side, this is uh, up to where the Roman Empire arrived and the exchanges of currency were happening. We found Roman uh, Caesar's uh, coins uh, in the excavation when we built the cavern. That was a new cavern that we built uh, at that point. And actually the whole uh, geological and uh, the whole uh, topological structure was such that there were roads and it was all um, lined up and, uh, and uh, it's an interesting area there. Um, I'm showing you here, I'm very proud of, uh, of our team. Um, over the years, we're missing some people, but not all. Uh, this is myself and Professor Newman, um, and uh, the guy in the middle uh, call, is called Lynn Evans. Uh, he, commissioned, he commissioned the LHC, and he blew it. Um, he, he, uh, he brought the first collisions in September 2008, and we had the accident. And he had to do that. The reason why he had to do that is because such a machine, um, unless you have a full simulation of the integrated pieces, um, then your prototype is the machine that you're bringing up at the time of commissioning. And more often than not, you will, uh, you will have a problem with it. And that's what happened in the beginning. Uh, he's now uh, 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 he's a, um, um, an official of the of the British Empire. He got many awards. I think he will be knighted um, post uh, the Higgs discovery. And uh, actually, he's uh, one of the people that um, I heard a quote from Margaret Thatcher. He quoted Margaret Thatcher saying that unless you do off-piste research, that it is not. Um, that it is not uh, driven R&D for some particular purpose. It's very hard to have big leaps in economy and in technology. And what we are doing is exactly that. There was no good way of saying that better. Uh, I was surprised, surprised that Margaret Thatcher said it, but uh, um, um, Indeed, if you think about it, when in, and you go back in, in the ages, uh, if, if you just did the directed uh, R&D, you would never go from the chariots to rocket moons. You would continue having very, very, very good chariots. Uh, these are the people of Caltech, the students, the graduate students, the fellows, the Caltech fellows. And here on the last row, I even have 
some of the undergraduate students, you got a pamphlet, I hope, as you were entering. Um, these are the last year's undergraduate students doing research um, at the Higgs discovery on many fronts at the Higgs discovery and the searches for dark matter. Our undergraduates um, in the whole collaboration are recognized that sometimes people are surprised. They ask, are these undergraduates? Uh, they're doing uh, tremendous work and they're extremely motivated. Um, this is the tunnel of the LHC. Um, <clears throat> these are the, the blue, the blue part is enclosing the, the superconducting magnets. The superconducting magnets, if you think about it, um, we have one enclosure, one magnetic field, but we have two beams of same sign particles, namely protons, traveling opposite directions in the same magnetic field. To prepare this magnetic field and to design this magnet was a completely non-trivial uh, adventure. And in fact, it was uh, done in 1972 in Brookhaven um, by John Blewett, who was a magnet physicist. Uh, he tried to convince the people of Brookhaven that we could do um, a machine called Isabel at the time, a collider called Isabel, but this didn't go forward. Um, People afterwards tried to convince uh, the SSC management that we could have one tunnel instead of two, but this didn't go forward. However, the LHC people, the Europeans, uh, went gung-ho on, um, um, on this uh, dual core magnet design of the LHC, which turned out to be the key in order to be able to fit in one tunnel, in one pipe, both, um, both uh, beams of, of protons and collide them. So this was completely non-trivial uh, achievement. Uh, and I should say, here's another, here's another shot of that. This is open here. Um, these are the interconnects here and here of the superconducting filament. Uh, the cables, the strands of the cables, there are niobium, titanium. The filaments are about um, 10 astronomical units with a little bit left to go to the moon and how big they are. And um, they, are, um, they are soldered from this supermagnet on that side to this, to this um, uh, dipole magnet. And uh, the reason why we had uh, the explosion is because these, these um, cables carry about 12,000 amps and they are soldered, and on top of them you've got what we call the bus, the copper bus, in case they get quenched, the 12,000 amps go in a damp resistor. So in our case, if you don't have them completely connected, you will have an arc and an explosion. That's what happened. And now the, um, the superconducting magnets, in order to be operating, they need to be at very low temperature, close to two Kelvin, and this is the feed of the helium uh, that keeps them at this temperature. When the explosion happened, there were no particles, so there was no radiation. But the helium, uh, which is fed in here and around the magnet, was brought to room temperature from liquid, and so it expanded, the volume expands by a thousand, and the forces that were exerted on the physical forces, it, we, you would have helium collisions basically, and the physical forces of when they found a barrier somewhere in the tunnel knocked down 53 magnets. Um, that was in uh, the uh, fall of 2008, we recovered very quickly, we fixed all the magnets, and we started the physics program um, towards the end of 2009. Um, in fact, I was running the experiment when we took the first high energy collisions and we beat the Tevatron, my previous uh, collider and the experiment that was there. Um, this is the impression, a little short clip from 2005. This is of historical value of the, of the LHC tunnel. Um, and you see, as we're going through, we will see the feeds for all the electric um, and all the damp resistors and uh, the cryo. Um, it is said that the LHC, uh, it, there is no such a, um, a, an experimental uh, adventure of this scale and uh, this complexity that was ever done by humans. Um, so uh, just to show you what happened, this is not at the, at the point of the explosion, the, the matter annihilated, there was nothing left, it was dust and soot. But at the point where the barrier kicked the last magnet, this is what happened to the magnets, and uh, this is the, the situation we were left to fix. So, um, well, this is uh, our experiment, the experiment that Caltech is involved in, our students, 
Um, it, uh, it is, uh, in a, as a Lego design, it, it is made of uh, uh, 12 modular pieces. It looks like, um, from, from the outside, it looks like a, like a, a cylinder. And it has many sub-detectors as you go closer and closer to the beam. Um, and it has two leads. Um, this part, the part in the middle, is called the central part or the barrel. And the parts closer to the horizon on that side, they're called the end cups and the forward regions. What we see here is the, is the central part, the barrel. And we see another piece um, of, uh, of uh, ingenious design. This is the. This is uh, our solenoidal magnet. It's also superconducting. It's at 3.8 Tesla. The magnets of the LHC, if you do the calculation in order for the particles to go at the speed of light and be kept at 27 kilometers, they have to have 8.3 Tesla. This is 3.8 or 4 Tesla. And uh, it is impressive because you do have this in medical applications, but you never had such a magnet that has such a big diameter. So if you calculate the energy, this, you can put a hammer in there. This is six meters. Um, so if you, if you calculate the energy, it holds 2.7 gigajoules. This is a humongous amount of energy. We, the, when we integrated it, and for the first time, uh, we powered up this magnet, we were not sure if it's not going to throw part of the detector to Lake Geneva. It would have this power. So um, in prototyping it, it's a smaller scale and smaller complexity than the entire LHC. So we did, we were confident that we did have all the simulations and we were not running this risk, but it's a prototype still, okay? The one that exists, it was a prototype. So now, um, one thing about the data, you hear it a lot, but big data and what we talk about big data right now is something that happened in high energy physics and collider physics specifically since a long time. Uh, at the LHC, uh, we've got 100 million channels per detector approximately, and the collisions are happening um, nominally 20, at 25 uh, nanoseconds. So that gives you, depending on the event size, and that's a matter of uh, computing and software architecture, about one petabyte per second. Now, you can compare this to the global um, World Wide Web traffic, which is five terabytes per second, or you can compare it in 2010 to the entire load of Google, and these numbers are from 11, actually, 2011. Uh, so we are really, um, we are really subject to tremendous amount of data, and we keep uh, an enormous amount of data, which immediately, there's not a single computing sign in the entire universe that can hold all this data. So immediately they get distributed, and Caltech actually um, uh, is the place where the, all the innovations that for the grid to happen and distribute the data, as well as more intelligent grids that are processing the data as they're being moved out, this is the place where all this happened. Actually, before my time, Professor Newman um, was uh, one of the biggest inventors of, of this. Uh, this is from the Department of Defense, um, how they describe the, the data and the, and the distribution of data before and after the LHC. This was before the LHC, and this is after the LHC. Uh, with all this data of the first two years of running, we got the discovery. So this was July 14. Uh, the discovery was captured well, the discovery did not happen on July, 4th, on July, um, on July 4th, uh, of course. Uh, we knew that it was, uh, we knew that we had signals uh, since we opened the blind analysis and we saw them starting in May and June. Um, and then we had many tests before we did the announcement. Um, you see here uh, the, our director of, of CERN, um, some of our students and, and postdocs were out waiting to be there. And this was in Australia, in Melbourne, where the biggest conference was taking place. And this is Mr. Higgs, who was crying. And, um, and uh, he said to my friend Fabiola here, I never expected this to happen in my lifetime. Subsequently to that, he said, when he was asked by the journalist, what is the Higgs, he said, I have no clue. And, I will return to this and why I think he knows what he's talking about. Um, now, there's one thing to be said about the Higgs, or a Higgs, or the particle we found that looks like the Higgs. Um, 
I think it has captured the imagination of people for many decades. Um, I remember when I was a student traveling to Geneva 20 years ago as an undergraduate to, to be part of an experiment that um, I, I was uh, sitting next to uh, uh, somebody who was an academic and I was explaining what I'm going to do at CERN and the person um, said to me, well, oh well, but, you, but the science will never be able to tell us where the mass is coming from. They have all these stories, but really that's not your, your science. What you're trying to do has a dead end because that's not going to happen. And uh, well, lo and behold, I don't know the person, but uh, uh, obviously with, uh, uh, with uh, the motivation of finding things that people think are impossible to find, you actually get somewhere. Where we got, we're going to see. Um, science is a magazine that covers usually biological sciences and we were on the front. The Economist, well, you see, The Economist thinks that we have to do something with astronomy um, and, and acrobatics. So they have uh, gymnastics and astronomy and astronomical things they have in Economist uh, co coined with Higgs discovery. Um, this was for the first time that the New York Times had a full section on the, on, on the full science section on one topic, the, the, the Higgs boson. And this is my friend Fabiola, who was number five, number, yes, number five, the time of the year, the time selected person of the year um, with, I think Barack Obama was number one. So now I'm going to describe some of the insights um, that uh, we uh, saw here at this demonstration uh, with, uh, with, this, uh, um, uh, with this piece of gadolinium um, and what kind of symmetry was broken as the temperature changed that made it from ferromagnetic to um, uh, paramagnetic. Um, these were the ideas that led Nambu to, um, to um, describe what, what they're called the Nambu Goldstone boson modes. They describe uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and spontaneous we take with a grain of salt because there was a lot of action here uh, before spontaneous symmetry breaking happened. There was temperature changes, something had to trigger that. And also, I will say this now, you know it from your freshman courses, that electromagnetism, um, which was perfected and united with the weak nuclear forces in this institute with Feynman and Gelman, is sourced by sources which are charges and currents, okay? And the question that people naturally ask is, what is sourcing um, the Higgs field? I gave an example here of a symmetry breaking where with the change of the temperature, we went from spontaneous magnetization below 20, Kelvin, below 20 degrees um, centigrade. The gadolinium is a ferromagnet, is fully magnetized. The little spins in the atoms are in one direction. And so, um, and below that temper, and above that temperature, uh, this, the little spins are in all direction, and it is paramagnetic. Something like that is the spontaneous symmetry. This idea was the exact idea that brought us to the electroweak symmetry breaking that gave us the Higgs. The Higgs is one of the Goldstone boson modes that Nambu was talking about. Um, you see this. Um, this is perfect rotational symmetry when this little ball is on the top of the pant. If you think about it as the bottle, um, this is the top of a bottle, or we usually call it the Mexican hat, and this is the rim. From going here, you have a perfect rotational symmetry. Here, the symmetry is broken, and you have an infinite state of what we call the vacuum here. Um, that means that the vacuum and the Lagrangian do not respect um, the same kind of symmetry. Um, and this is the, the picture we use for, for symmetry breaking. And these are the analogs in Nambu's, Nambu. Uh, I want to impress on you that the discovery of the ideas of the Higgs mechanism, spontaneous symmetry breaking, and the standard model of particle physics so far got two Nobel Prizes. And in October, there will be a third one for Mr. Higgs because his name is the particle that we just found and some other people. Um, so 
uh, Nambu and Goldstone, they got um, Nambu and, uh, from Chicago and Goldstone, uh, actually from Chicago also, they got the, the Nobel Prize for um, the importance of spontaneous symmetry breaking um, and the problems of massless bosons. These are the kind of Goldstone bosons that are generated when you have the symmetry breaking. And the example I gave you here, that it is a similar example of spontaneous symmetry breaking that is happening in the electroweak model of particles and their interactions is the ferromagnetic one, where there is a broken symmetry, which symmetry, the rotational invariance, it's the spins of the particles of the atoms inside the metal that we saw. And um, um, this happens in other materials, in crystals and uh, in superconductors. And going from this symmetry, which was just the rotational invariance, to the symmetry in the crystals that is broken, which is both translational, as you have in the crystals, you have the atoms in particular orders and steps. Both translational and rotational, therefore, when it's broken, we call this phonons. In the superconductors, when we have a, a new sense of more esoteric, esoteric symmetry called the local gauge invariance, broken, you get something else and you get something which looks like a massive photon in superconductors, the Cooper pairs that you have heard about. So these are the ideas that Nambu was talking about, the cross-fertilization, case of cross-fertilizations, because these ideas started from many body systems, from things that you actually can study with your hands, not quantum ideas of flying things that you, don't, that you only have concepts about. Um, so, um, Anderson, in 1962, took it a step farther and actually described exactly what that, um, exactly what that local gauge invariance superconductors would, uh, would be. Um, it would be something like um, um, a, a massive photon, and the problems in symmetry breaking of creating only mass less, without mass, uh, bosons, was reconciled in in some sort of a cancellation. He went on a very big, uh, um, he, that was a leap in thinking on how he would reconcile uh, the, um, the, the local gauge invariance breaking with not a massless boson, but something that was a massive, almost a massive photon. It was the set, a set of electrons that we call Cooper pairs now. Um, now, there was one step more, that was 1962, one step more in 1964. What happened was that uh, Higgs um, did the relativistic analog. In the relativistic analog, all the math was working the same. But now, I can't show it to you. There is not matter, there's no condensed matter, there's no material. It's the vacuum now. And this is why it's difficult to describe the Higgs mechanism without using analogies that some, some, sometimes are weird. Uh, what is happening, however, this is the, we, we've got the Goldstone bosons and we've got um, one, two, three of them. These are four Higgses here. Three of them are eaten up and they are creating the W plus, W minus, and Z. The W plus, W minus, and Z, we found they are massive, and we found them in the 80s. So these were the first three, the first three phases, quantum phases of the Higgs boson, and that's the little one that remained. To the, we, we took 40 years. We took. We found it now. We found it in in July, and lo and behold, the standard model for which um, um, Steven Weinberg, uh, Salam, and Glashow, Shelley Glashow, got the Nobel Prize. Uh, was completed. This used to be a nefarious idea. And the, that was another huge leap because Weinberg took all these ideas from everybody and he said, I will make sense of everything that we know experimentally about all the subatomic particles. And that included the quarks and the leptons and the neutrinos and the forces. I will make sense of all of this together by using the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs mechanism will be such that it will give mass to this, this, and uh, to, to the W, uh, plus minus the Z. Uh, it will remain. It will leave the photon and the gluon massless, and it will give masses to the quarks and uh, the leptons. The neutrinos remain massless, and this is a puzzle still in the standard model. You see, Shelley Glashow is not in this picture because um, he was he was my teacher, and he was calling the Higgs the toilet of the standard model. 
the reason was because he thought that it was a cop-out. It was beautiful mathematically. It was working. The, anal the analogy from condensed matter theory was working, but why would it have to be that? This was not to him. This was appearing a very fantastical thing. And a posteriori, uh, it is. It, uh, I think we, we are, I am stunned that we actually found what this, what we predicted, um, what these people predicted, the theories predicted. It's a big, big um, um, victory uh, for human uh, thinking and for the experiment. It's a fit. So the Higgs boson, as I, sh I show you before, this is the, this is the equation, uh, this is the kinematics and the, the equation of motion, let's say, for the particles. I don't want you to understand this at all, but I want you to keep in mind that we have the, the, the Higgs um, breaking the symmetry. This is the Lagrangian uh, before breaking the symmetry, and this is the Lagrangian after breaking the symmetry. So there are all these terms, and it's a mess. Um, but however, it's such a beautiful mess in which sense um, we got light in these equations. There it is. We got electricity and magnetism in these equations. There they are. We got the weak nuclear forces, the way the sun works with the, with the, um, with the thermonuclear interactions, we got them here. The W and the Z are the weak gauge bosons that got the mass from the Higgs. And we have mass. The Higgs handshakes with the electron, the U quark, the Ws and the Zs here, and th those um, states acquire mass. That was the that was the, the scenery at the auditorium at CERN. I think I was just behind this guy there. But um, this is Fabiola and uh, this is uh, Gianotti, the head at that moment. She was uh, running the other experiment, the Atlas experiment. And Mr. Higgs who was very uh, happy uh, because the experimentalists did actually go about this and found it. Uh, so now there's many questions we can ask. Um, we have measured the particle that um, we have discovered the particle in the decay modes of photons and Z bosons. And uh, that looks like it has the, 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 it's the right way to go about the Higgs particle. But however, we need to make measurements of its properties, um, detailed measurements of its properties before we say that it is really the Higgs. And these properties are determined, uh, are being studied by the way it's produced the, the Large Hadron Collider collides protons, which is a collection, a collection of quarks and gluons. And in fact, at these high energies that we collide them, it's a gluon collider. This is the biggest mode of creating the Higgs. Um, as, um, as I will show you in a bit, the, it, it goes here from gluons, which are massless, and in a mode that decays into photons, which are massless. So this is kind of ironic because one of the decays that we found it first, the diphoton decay, is coming from massless to massless, but there is loops here with massive uh, quarks. This is again a fit for quantum field theory. This is how it decays. There are many decays modes. Don't, don't, don't let this uh, um, um, get in your head too much. The main thing is, is that we know how it decays. We can calculate in which state it decays. And in every calculation of these famous Feynman diagrams, we got the particle shaking hands with the, with the particles that it gives mass. So this is the Higgs particle with two bottom quarks. If we measure that very well and we can measure the coupling of the Higgs to the bottoms, then we start getting the properties of the Higgs boson and how it couples to all masses. Similarly here, and non-masses by the way, because here we've got the tops. These are massless, these are the photons. This is what the detector is, is measuring. This is a muon in CMS. It will traverse the entire detector. This is the one section that I'm showing you here transversely. Inside here, there is tracking. The muon leaves tracks, and then it's electromagnetic calorimeter, hadron calorimeter, the solenoid, and the muon chambers. That was an electron. It stops at the electromagnetic calorimeter. A neutral hadron, it doesn't have charge, so it zips through the camera, the, the silicon camera, and it stops in the hadron calorimeter. A charged one, it leaves a track, and it stops in the hadron calorimeter. 
and this is the photon. It will zip through without doing anything in the tracker and it will stop in the electromagnetic calorimeter. This is what uh, uh, Caltech is involved in the electromagnetic calorimeter, in the Hadron calorimeter, and also in the trigger for all the particles and for all the, the Higgs. There is a, one of the candidate events. We think it's a, um, it, if we make the invariant mass of these photons, it falls in the, in the mass of the Higgs. It's 126 GeV, it's a fantastic candidate event. And um, this, in order to get to this, I will mention here a technical detail that we have to uh, calibrate 76,000 of crystals of lead tank state um, to a percent level in order to be able to measure the Higgs. And we do that at Caltech. We build the laser system that is doing the calibration of the crystals. As they get irradiated, the crystals lose transparency. And then they recover because of the color centers annihilated. They recover the transparency. And so you have to monitor this live, and that's what we do. As it, it runs, the laser system runs every 40 minutes. Our graduate students were on call all the time the previous three years that we were taking data in order to be able to make the discovery. The other golden channel is the channel that has four leptons. Based on this channel is how we build these detectors. We build them so that they discover four muons at all ranges of the, from, from 50 GeV to 1 TeV energies of these muons with 1% precision. And that was the single one um, specification requirement in order to do the full specification of the detectors. Here you see them, four muons. And uh, in, the, in the case that one Z boson decays into two electrons, you have uh, two muons and two electrons. One pair from one Z, one pair from another. If I make the invariant mass of all this, it has to give me the Higgs boson, all right? And that's what it happens. Um, now, I want to mention that this all is happening amidst, in every, col in every collision we have, we've got actually up to 40 interactions. So there are 40 events in an event. But you see here, these are the vertices looking on the, on the beam direction, on the Z. This is about 15 centimeters, and we've got a millimeter resolution for each of these vertices. And uh, well, you see that there are these four electrons, these four muons, these four leptons come from one single vertex, so we know it's one event. Um, let me show you a little, uh, a little clip of, from the beginning of data taking, how the data looked like in Atlas for the diphoton channel, until uh, we exclaimed that this little blip here is the Higgs. We wouldn't have exclaimed anything if we didn't have it in another channel, all right? So the other channel was this one, is the four, um, is the four leptons that I told you, the golden one. Two Z bosons, each 90 GV. I'm lying, it's a Z and the Z star, it's not on shell, it's a Z and a half, because the Higgs is 126, it's here. Four leptons make one Higgs, that's it. And four leptons make also a Z because in, we have an internal calibration in our data, which is the Z boson uh, um, uh, decaying into two leptons, but also we have a radiation of a photon that also can decay into two leptons. However, these four leptons, we make a Z mass and not a Higgs mass. And the Higgs, when it decays to two Zs, to, two, to four leptons, will make a Higgs mass. Well, one of the first things we did is that we said with this data, what can we do? And the first thing we can do is we can reject all possible evident imposters. In other words, all bad theories immediately will get, uh, will get uh, um, rejected. And this is the type of results that say that we reject the pseudo-scalar interpretation compared to the scalar, which is the standard model Higgs. But that doesn't mean we have measured the spin of the Higgs yet. There's a lot of work. So all the evident bad theories with this data, we have, uh, we have junked them. Sorry for the theorists. Uh, still, uh, we can, still, the question is, can we have, uh, uh, how can we know that this is the only Higgs and not many Higgs? And this is a very good question. In fact, in supersymmetry, we've got up to five Higgses, and supersymmetry is an extension of the standard model that it is mathematically, you might say, even more beautiful than the Higgs mechanism because it does everything that the standard model is doing and it gives you the dark matter and it gives you unification. It gives you, so it, the, mathematically speaking and in terms of physical, physics elegance, it's really tremendous whether nature is doing that or not. We can't say, 
We have to measure it. We have to find it. Um, so, uh, well, so this is a this is a, um, a statement that I want you to take of that. That supersymmetry predicts at least five kinds of Higgs bosons that are differing in their mass and other properties. And what I ask my students is a joke for that. And the joke was. Uh, well, they found five pictures of Higgs that differs in different times, that differs in mass, in his mass, and other properties. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say for supersymmetry a couple of things, and then I'm going to close, going back on the implication. Um, well, supersymmetry, first of all, people, when they say that they are depressed, the supersymmetry is not found, I want to remind everybody that we have run the machine at half the, at a little over half the, specific, the specified energy. And let me show you in numbers, the Higgs boson has a rate that is up there. The, you, don't need to, you don't need to look at anything, just this axis is the rate of a process, of a physics process to happen, and this is the mass of the particle involved. So the Higgs is somewhere here, 125, and it had a rate up here. There were a lot produced. Supersymmetry is down here where we're looking right now. So we need quite a lot more data and, and more energy before we can say um, that it is completely excluded. So this is a, a, a Caltech-made plot um, of how we uh, express what part we excluded of SUSY, and I want, to, I want to make sure that everybody understands that some SUSY models, and formally there are infinite of them, have been excluded. A colleague of mine at Slack calculated that about one-third of the models of the full uh, what is called parametric MSSM, uh, which is the minimal supersymmetric standard model, have been excluded. And to close now, well, um, I want to remind how we started. We started when I, ex I said that the electromagnetic field, and upon it was built all the electroweak uh, model and the standard model, the electroweak standard model. We know what sources it. It sources it um, charges and currents. That's Freshman ENM. The Higgs field is sourcing itself, and this is a very important thing to remember. It, permeates the entire universe and it sources itself. And it is the, an, a new force, essentially, that we have found that it is not lying in a gauge boson. Uh, with this, I want to tell you one, um, one last thing. Um, it has um, the, the, the Higgs field is self-sourcing and it has a self-interaction strength lambda. And also, it has quantum corrections. Now, let's focus one minute on the lambda because that, that was recently in the news and people got scared. If this lambda, now we have the numbers so we can calculate things, but if this lambda goes negative, then this hat, this rim here of the, of the, of the, Higgs, hat, of the Higgs hat turns around, okay? This is how it looks like. I had a postdoc made a, made a, made a uh, graph here. Oh. This is the Higgs potential. This was the vacuum. We were here, and as we turn lambda, um, as the lambda is negative, and we look at the strength, well, there is another vacuum. This is what was in the news recently. The fireballs of, uh, of doom of the universe. What is going to happen? Um, and I want to mention that this possibility was actually studied for the first time um, in 1979 by Politzer and Wolf from here at Caltech. And uh, now that we have the numbers, we can say whether this is the case or not. In fact, if you believe in supersymmetry, this is just uh, the fact that the universe is in the, in the brim of doom in 10 to the 100 years, if I want to be truthful, then it's just a coincidence. But what it is telling us is that there is something more other than the Higgs. Um, how the Higgs is, uh, how spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking is happening and mass is created at the beginning of the universe in the electroweak phase transition cannot be explained with the Higgs only. So uh, there are many options. People are, are talking about uh, Planck scale boundary conditions. Um, there is a uh, Perhaps, as we have spontaneous symmetry breaking, there are more symmetry breakings that are causing the spontaneous symmetry breaking in, of the electroweak sector, or perhaps the Higgs is a direct portal to dark matter. This is a, this is a nice, simple model that connects the Higgs to the dark matter, and this is where physics and astronomy, this is really two streets in, uh, in, Rome, in the University of Rome in Sapienza. Um, physics and astronomy meet together, and here, um, is Sviki 70 years ago here at Caltech, 
um, he uh, talked about uh, the dark matter based on the virial theorem, only on gravitational interactions. So uh, in the case we are talking about now, the, the dark matter can have interactions through the Higgs. If this is the case, then we, we have a chance with the direct dark matter experiments to find dark matter. Last time when I was here at the alumni, three years ago, it was after the, after the big explosion, and I said to people that um, with, with, with optimism, I can promise you a Higgs. Now, I cannot promise you a dark matter in the next three years, but if we find it, I will not be surprised. Um, with this, I want to close with a final thought, um, which is this. The meaning of the Higgs discovery is that we really have to think different. And I think what Mr. Higgs was saying when he said, I have no clue, is this. Because where this is taking us, given what we have observed and what we have not observed, uh, it means that we need to think different in order to go a step to the dark matter and the dark energy of the universe. And I think uh, paradigm shifts are awaiting for us and discoveries. Thank you. Two minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Spurpulo. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I, uh, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Uh, I want to ask you a question about your intuition in science, not your uh, facts as an experimentalist. Yes. When you look at this uh, beautiful mess of the standard model, yes. is it correct? Is the universe really that complex? But the question is, when you look at this uh, mess of the, of yes, you are talking, we have a nice mathematical mess, indeed. Uh, it's this one. Um, you remember it. it. It was looking intimidating for anyone, um, in, including all of us who have had to go through this in quantum field theory at school. Um, this one. Um, right. Um, well, so um, I, I will I will speak to you with my uh, with with my knowledge. So my intuition will will come a, uh, a step forward with the knowledge that we have and I have so far. Um, this uh, and this is a language that it works for nature so far. This is not by no means it says that it is. Um, um, it is describing nature fully at all, and all phenomena at all energy scales. It happens to describe nature up to the 10 to the minus 24, up to the, to the uh, level that we have understood, that we have probed, if you want, space time. When we talk about the Planck scale, this is where you're challenging me, I can safely tell you that we don't know what we're talking about. As an experimentalist, and I think all my co experimental ex colleagues will agree with me because we don't have experiments that go to the Planck scale. The theorists do. Their intuitions say that we have Gedanken experiments that go to the Planck scale. <laughs> and for them, a black hole is a laboratory. It's a thinking laboratory. The physics of gravity, for example, and how you connect it with a black hole and the physics that I described to you if you want to talk about mess, that is a big, big mess. If you ask them, they will tell you, we have string theory, it's elegant, it's beautiful. If you look at it, it's a language, it's a framework. For them it works, but without experiment, I cannot, I cannot say anything. This language, for me it works because I have all the experimental measurements up to that level that work. The intuition now of whether there's going to be more than one Higgs and how we will connect with the rest of the questions that is, is a huge number of questions um, regarding even now with the Higgs, why do we have three families? Why do we have, what did we need the muon and the tau? How baryogenesis happened really? I say it's self-sourcing, but why is it self-sourcing at 10 to the minus 11 second? Is the Big Bang correct? What, you know, all of these in, intuitively, I think my intuition is that we have to, to change the way we think. But this will never be violated. It will be embraced, but it will never be violated. For this, I am sure. Well, last question. Uh, 
are you an American citizen? <laughs> Sorry? You're a taxpayer, I'm very glad for that. So, me too. Um, so, uh, first of all, the Higgs discovery and the claim of the, of the US on the Higgs discovery, which without the US it wouldn't have happened. However, for us, uh, it happened very cheaply because uh, we didn't build the SEC. We saved a bunch of money. Uh, now, um, for the scale of the cost of this type of experiments in the future, uh, I can promise you that the, unless we figure out some innovative technology on how to do, I don't know what, plasma acceleration, wake field acceleration, uh, beam me up Scotty things, I don't know what it's going to be, but otherwise we, sound, we, we look dumb even because we can't just scale up and go to the Fermi dream around the world. No, we have to do something smarter. We, are sti we still have not reached that and the yield, the, the physics, yield of the discovery is so, is so paramount, big that all the intermediate technologies that we have developed have paid the, 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 uh, the LHC already, what we have done. Uh, so uh, that, so far as we are now, and maybe m one more generation, we're not going to discuss the, the cost versus uh, benefit. Somebody made actually a real study and we come way ahead on the, on the cost benefit for economy, for the society, for technology. You cannot promise, of course, these things ahead of time. So, and also you cannot make a case in the politicians in Washington that we, are, we want to do this because of a spin-off. That's a bad business plan, and we don't do that. Um, what I started with saying is that off-piste, not directly direct R&D driven for something in particular research, um, has proven to make huge leaps. And this is a framework for thinking different. This is building a framework for thinking different. So for the moment, I think we are okay, but what you are saying is very valid, and we, for, future, for the future, where we are going with this, we're not gonna be the Planck Collider with this kind of technologies and ask you to pay for it, no. One thing I might mention is that uh, in the future, when this thing is upgraded, we're talking about going up to what, 30? 30? 30, 33 TV, but we don't know the technology of the magnets yet because it's supposed to go in the same tunnel. And I should say that when we started the design of this machine, the magnets, the, the dipole magnets were not proven to work. They were prototypes. So we, um, in, in uh, Europe at that time, historically, this is an interesting story, Europe at that time wanted to use science in order to get out of the mess of the war and to start bringing together Italians and Germans and Greeks, etc. That that was a mess. And in order to do that, they did. That's why also it's in, in Europe and in Switzerland. They said they were going to do it through uh, science. And they said one of the targets they said, uh, I hope I'm not recorded, or some of this has to go out, um, was that they had to beat the U.S. The it took them 50 years, and the cancellation of the SSE and some you know, hiccups that we had here, mostly, I think, political, uh, or bad management, or you know, post-military, post-war uh, kind of, of glitches, uh, unavoidable in a sense. Um, but then they caught up. We, without what we have done at Stanford, at Berkeley, at, um, at Brookhaven, uh, at, especially at Fermilab with the Tevatron Collider, and with all the uh, intellectual, yes, we, we wouldn't have done One thing I mentioned, you were at the Fermi lab, and that was the predecessor to this. Yes. And at that time, the highest energy accessible by the lab was what? Two, two TV, and we went a jump to seven TV, and with seven and eight TV, two runs, which was half of the, of the 14 TV of the LHC, we, we had this big discovery. And um, the promise of this is to go up to 30. 33 TV in so 2025. So you're looking at 15 times greater energy. Who knows what's going to be there? We That's hope a lot. That's what makes it exciting. Yes. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.